Well, good morning. Good morning. We are going to continue our journey with Joseph this morning. And if you can remember back to yesterday, we began Joseph's journey by picking up his story in Genesis chapter 37. And there we found a young man, 17 years old, living in, in quite a dysfunctional home. If you'll remember, there were four moms, but by the time the story begins, there's three because Joseph's own mother died giving birth to his youngest brother, Benjamin. And so there was lots of turmoil in the home. His ten older brothers were unruly. They were a pretty crazy bunch. And as we found out yesterday, so much hatred and so much jealousy had filled their hearts over Joseph, over his goody two-shoes, over his tattletaling, over the dreams, over being dad's favorite and having better clothes and all those things. And Joseph is sold by his brothers to some Ishmaelite traders and he is on his way to Egypt. And yesterday we said, meanwhile, right? Meanwhile, God was still at work. And, and we're going to pick up Joseph's story in Ch Genesis chapter 39 today. And, and we're going to look at, at, at his entrance to Egypt and what happens to him in Egypt. And then from that, I, I want us to, to take a very practical application this morning about something that we all face and all deal with in life. So let's dive into Genesis chapter 39 this morning and begin just with verse 1. Genesis chapter 39, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now Joseph had been taken to Egypt, and an Egyptian named Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard, brought him from the Ish bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him there. So we find that in Genesis chapter 39 that, that Joseph is arriving in a completely new country. I, I mean, you can just imagine you're 17 years old and, and you've been sold by your brothers. You were terrified. You're probably still terrified. You were taken to a place that was so strange and new and different. You know, Joseph had grown up in the country and now he's been taken to one of the largest cities in the world. It, it, the sounds are different. The smells are different. Everything's different. And there in this strange new place where people talk an unknown language, he is put on a slave auction and he's bought by a man named Potiphar. But remember, it says, meanwhile, right, although life seemed to be out of control, the unseen hand of God was at work because God had purposes and plans for Joseph. God had given dreams to Joseph, and God hadn't given up on Joseph. But Joseph is, is, is bought by this man named Potiphar, and, and historians would say that not only was he captain of the guard, but he was likely the chief executioner in Egypt. And so Potiphar is a powerful and influential man in the Egyptian military and Egyptian government. And he sees Joseph and he thinks, hmm, he looks strong. Looks like I might be able to get some work out of him. Decent price. And so he buys Joseph. And look at what verse 2 says, though. Because although Joseph's life has been shattered, Right? Although his life has been interrupted. Look at what verse 2 says. It says, the Lord was with Joseph. Now, on the surface, we might say, man, it doesn't really seem, it doesn't feel like he was with Joseph. Right? I mean, he let Joseph get sold by his brothers. He, he, he let him get shipped off and be sold as a slave. But it says God was with him. You see, there are times in life where God will allow circumstances in your life and in my life that we don't understand, that we don't like, that don't make sense to us. But it does not mean that God has abandoned you or God has forgotten you. It does not mean that he's not with you. And he was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. And listen. Listen to what he says, because God was with him and he blessed him, it says he became a successful man serving in the household of his Egyptian master. God allowed something that happened in Joseph's life that was not good, right? It was not good to be sold by his brothers. It was not good that that happened, but God was at work and God hadn't abandoned him. And so because of God's presence in his life, because of God's empowerment in his life, because of God's blessing, and because of Joseph's faithfulness and his integrity, God blesses him and he gives him favor. And so as we read the story, we'll, we'll see that, that Joseph was faithful in all that he did. He was faithful in serving. And just let's continue the story there in Genesis 39. 
and just see what, what God does. But then we're going to see something happen that's pretty, pretty crazy. Look at verse 3. It says that his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. And from the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house because of Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in his house and field. So he left all he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food that he ate. And so Joseph's life is, is really, it's a wild journey because he goes from being sold as a slave and, and you know, when you start out as a servant in someone's home, you start out in the lowest position. Joseph probably worked outside in the fields, but it became apparent that there was something different about Joseph and his master Potiphar noticed that and, and says because of God's blessing, Joseph was promoted in Potiphar's house all the way to the point where he becomes the head of Potiphar's household. He runs all of his affairs, his finances, his business, everything. Potiphar puts him in charge of everything. And so although life was not what Joseph would have dreamed it to be, life is getting a little bit better. And even though he's not a free man per se, he, you know, he has been advanced. He's got a, a great position now in Potiphar's house and, and things are looking up. And, and, and I, love, I love what it says there um, about Potiphar. Did you, did you catch that in verse 6? He only had to worry about what? What he ate. You know, would not life be great if your only concern, your only worry, your only stress was what's for dinner? Right? And then Potter, the only thing he, you know, everything was taken care of. The only thing he had to think about was what is for dinner? And so life is, is better. But look at the end. Look at the end of verse 6. Or we, we, we left off in the middle of verse 6. So let's look at the end of verse 6. It says, Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Think, well, what's that got to do with the story? Well, we're about to see. So life is looking up. Joseph is working hard. He's running Potiphar's house. God's blessing him. Things are looking up again. But he's a good-looking young man. A good-looking young foreign man. The kind girls fall for, guys, all right? And somebody did fall for him, but it wasn't just a girl, it was Potiphar's wife. And so let's, let's continue on with the story. Let's look in verses 6 and 7. In verses 6 and 7 it says, Now Joseph was well built and handsome, and after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph, and she said, Come to bed with me. Wow, that just got real, didn't it? Joseph is confronted with a situation now that he's going to have to make a decision very, very quickly. You see, we all face temptation in life. Right? One thing that, that you and I have in common is that we experience temptation. Temptation to go outside of the boundaries that God has established for us as his children to find fulfillment or pleasure or satisfaction and so there is always temptation over us. But Joseph, you know, sometimes temptation is subtle. But this is one of those smack you in the face moments. And Joseph is going to have to make a decision very quickly about what he's going to do. Joseph is going to have to decide in this moment what is he going to do. And so we see it in verse 8 and 9, his response. But he refused. But he refused. And then he said this, with me in charge, he told her, my master, your husband, right, does not concern himself with anything in the house. Man, he says, your husband doesn't have any worries. He, he says, everything he owns, he's entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you're his wife. You're his wife. Right? Can you just imagine Joseph sort of maybe putting a little emphasis on the word wife there? Like, hello, you're married, all right? How then, he says, could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? He said, 
How could I do such a wicked thing? You see, what influences us most at the moment of temptation is what we believe. What influences most at the moment of temptation is what we believe. Belief always determines behavior. We always act out on what we believe. And our actions ultimately show us what we really believe. And so Joseph refuses. Sometimes think about that phrase. But he refused. How easy would it have been for Joseph not to refuse? I mean, Joseph could have made all sorts of rationalizations about this. Right? I'm sure the flirt, I'm sure that this didn't just completely come out of the blue. I'm sure there were flirtatious looks. I'm sure there were suggestive comments. Joseph knew this moment might come. And he refused. But it, it would have been easy to justify it. No one's going to find out. I run this house. I deserve this. When in Egypt, right? And what happens in Egypt stays in Egypt. <laughs> Joseph could have made all sorts of rationalizations, and isn't that what we often do when we're confronted with temptation? We rationalize. We, we begin to make reasons in our mind why this is okay for me. Oh, it's probably okay, not okay for others, right? But I can handle this. I can get away with this. I can do this. But Joseph refused. What influences us most at the moment of temptation, what gives us the ability and what gave Joseph the ability to refuse is what he believed. See, it's said that he says, I can't sin against my master, right? He says, I serve a master. I, I am loyal to him. But then he said, even greater than that, this would be sin against my God. And I have loyalties to him. I have loyalties to my master and loyalties to my God that are greater than even my loyalties to myself. What he believed determined his behavior. And temptations must be met with convictions. You see, Joseph didn't have to, to wrestle with in the moment. Is this right? Is this wrong? Should I? Shouldn't I? I don't know. Let me text one of my... You know, it wasn't one of those situations. And listen... You know, friends are a wonderful blessing. But remember, at your age, your friends don't have much more wisdom than you do. Are you with me? All right. And so sometimes texting your friends is great, but sometimes it's not going to give you the wisdom that you need. Temptations must be met with convictions. And his response indicated a loyalty to his master and a loyalty to his God. A loyalty to his master and a loyalty to his God. Here's the thing. He thought it through. And think about Joseph's story. Joseph had witnessed personally with his own eyes the devastation that sin can bring in a life and in a family. Listen, he watched his brother, his oldest brother Reuben, who chose to have sex with one of his stepmoms. All right? All right. Listen, we said Joseph's story makes us feel better about our family situations. He saw the pain that that caused his father. He saw the broken relationship. He saw the anguish. He saw the devastation that sin brought. Joseph had saw it and he thought it through. He witnessed that pain. He also remembered the dreams that God gave him. He says, God's got plans for my life. I don't know how he's going to work it out. But God gave me dreams. And so what he believed determined his behavior and it gave him the power to refuse. Here's the thing. What you want now is often the enemy of what you want most. It's really important to remember that in the moment, what you want now, right? And we're sort of a now people, aren't we? We live in a now world. Have it now. You need it now. Do what tastes right. Do what feels good. Satisfy yourself. But sometimes what we want most now is the enemy of what we really want. And we need to have the ability to say no to ourselves. To say no to our desires. To say no to ourselves. Belief determines behavior. And what influences you and I most at the moment of temptation is what you and I believe. Joseph believed that loyalty to his master was important. Joseph believed that loyalty to God 
was paramount. So his belief enabled him to say no to his desires. Belief determines behavior. Do I believe that my immediate gratification is more important than the long-term plans that God has for me? Do I believe that God is good? Do I believe that God loves me? Right? What I believe will determine my behavior when it comes to temptation. What do you believe? What do you believe about God? Do you believe he's good? I love this verse in James chapter 1, verse 15. It says, then when desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. So it says desire, temptation. It says when we pursue it, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it brings forth death. Why do I love that verse? Because it brings an awareness of the truthfulness about sin and about temptation. You see, we often minimize sin and we minimize what sin does. But sin always produces death. It says the desire, the temptation, when it's conceived and when it gives birth, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it brings forth death. You see, a lot of times the consequences of our sin are not immediately apparent. You know, sometimes you do something and you get caught right away. But how many of you had a situation where you did something and you didn't get caught right away? All right, are you with me? Right, sometimes you get away for a while. But listen, if you're God's child, ultimately he's not going to let you get away with it because he loves you. But your sin will find you out. And sin, when it's grown up, brings forth death. Sin always costs more than advertised. All right? Satan is a master advertiser, and he knows how to put the real cost in really fine print. Sin always costs more than advertised. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you want to pay. Catch that out. Sin will take you further than you want to go. You see, a lot of times we think we can manage our sin. We can manage that area of life, but you can't manage sin. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you want to pay. And in the moment of temptation, we often underestimate the cost and overestimate the gratification of our choice, don't we? We get so caught up in the moment, and Joseph could have got caught up in the moment. He said, this will be really good. This will be a thrill. This will be exciting. No one will know. No one will find out. In fact, Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, said stolen bread tastes sweet. There's a thrill in sin in the moment. But Solomon also said, not only does stolen bread taste sweet, but afterwards it turns to gravel in your mouth. How many of you ever had dirt in your mouth? Would you rank it as one of the more pleasant experiences of your life? No. All right, it's not pleasant. The texture isn't pleasant. The taste isn't. There's nothing good about it. Now, sweet bread, now that's pleasant, isn't it? You with me? Think Krispy Kreme? <laughs> see, sin can feel and seem so good in the moment. He says, afterwards, it turns to gravel in our, our mouth. So James goes on. After verse 15, when he talks about sin bringing forth death. And so he says, so he says don't be deceived. He says, don't, don't buy into the lie that going outside of the boundaries that God has determined for our lives, that that will be good for you. And said, he said, instead, believe something different. He says, my beloved brothers, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above, is from God, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow to ch do to change. And so what is he saying? He's saying, don't think that fulfillment comes from going outside of God and away from God and disobeying God, that that's a good idea. He says, realize that God wants to give you good gifts and good things. And so trusting him and not buying into the lie that going outside of God's boundaries will be good for us. This is the secret. This is what Joseph knew. This is what those who find victory over temptation know that others don't. That God gives good gifts, a profound belief that God has our best interests at heart, that he is good and that he will provide for us and that if we have desires, that they're good desires, that God will fulfill them, that we can trust our desires to God. But listen, that doesn't mean that life will get easier. It, it doesn't mean that if you resist temptation, that all of a sudden everything will be perfect or good or easy. In fact, we're going to see for Joseph, it was just the opposite. 
Because Potiphar's wife just didn't take his refusal. She didn't just be like, oh, okay, Joe, you know, sorry about that. No, it says she kept after him day after day, day after day. You see, temptation is not a one-time thing. It goes on and on and on. So day after day, she keeps offering herself to Joseph, keeps enticing him, keeps tempting him. She keeps sending him crazy texts. Just kidding, they didn't have phones. Just want to see how awake you were. So what happens? He keeps resisting and he keeps refusing. Eventually she has enough. And so one day they're alone together in the house and she presents herself to him. And he refuses again. And this time she's had enough. And so she grabs his cloak. And man, it's just always about his clothes, isn't it? She grabs his cloak and he runs away. He flees. He gets out of there. And she has his clothes. And she's mad and she's upset. And so she decides to plot some revenge. And so she accuses him of attempted rape. And she tells all the other household workers, this is what Joseph did. And she sends the story out through all the house and gets the rumor really simmering so that when her husband comes home, everyone's talking about it. And then she blames, man, Potiphar's wife was, hmm, all right. She blames her husband, right? She says, this Hebrew that you brought here, he tried to rape me. And it says that Potiphar became enraged. And it doesn't say he was most angry at, but I think he was probably angry at her because he knew her ways. But he had to do something to save face. And so he has Joseph thrown into prison. And you and I might step back, right? And you might think, where's God in that? Right? Like Joseph did the right thing over and over again. Shouldn't God have rewarded him better? Right? I mean, what kind of reward is that? What kind of, what kind of God would, would, would say, wow, you did great, now go to jail? But look at what verse 21 says. The Lord was what? With him. There's that same verse, that same phrase again. The Lord was with him and he showed him kindness and he granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. God did reward him, but not with what he may have wanted. In fact, we can be pretty sure it wasn't with what Joseph wanted. I don't think Joseph wanted to go to jail. Are you with me? All right, I'm sure when he prayed for, for God to work in this situation, he wasn't saying, God, if you want me to send me to jail, I'm cool with that. I, I think he was saying, God, help me, protect me. And, and he ends up in jail. But God didn't give Joseph what he wanted, but he gave him what he needed. He gave him himself. And he was with him. And he blessed him with his presence, with his kindness, and with his favor. And we'll find that Joseph continues to trust God and he's going to be faithful in prison. We're going to leave off of Joseph's story for here today and we'll pick it up tomorrow. But what I want us to do is to, to think about some implications for our lives. Life is unpredictable. And it might not be as wild of a ride for you as it was for Joseph, but life will be unpredictable. And in the unpredictableness of life, temptation will come. But here's what I want you to realize. Temptation is not sin. Right? Satan loves to make you feel guilty about being tempted. But even Jesus was tempted, right? Temptation is not sin. Being tempted to sin, having a desire to sin, is not sin. Are you with me? But what it is, it's a moment. It's an opportunity for us to make a decision and for us to make a choice. And what we believe will determine our behavior. And like Joseph, we need to figure out who we're loyal to. You see, Joseph had a master. His name was Potiphar. He was loyal to him. And if you are in Christ, if you know Jesus as your Savior, if you're a child of God, if you've come to him by faith and experienced his grace and the forgiveness of your sin, I want you to know that you also have a master. And his name is Jesus. But he's not like Potiphar. He's a perfect master who loves you and gave himself up for you and purchased you at the cost of his own blood. And he calls you 
that if you've come into a relationship with Him, to trust Him and to be loyal to Him and to be faithful to Him because of the love and the grace and the mercy that He's demonstrated to you. And so you and I need to ask this question, who's my master? Right? Am I my own master? Does my life belong to me? Or is what the Bible says that I was bought at a price and my life doesn't belong to me anymore and therefore I'm called to glorify God with my body, with my life? Belief determines behavior. And so we need to think about this question, to whom does your life belong? To whom does your life belong? Does it belong to you or does it belong to Jesus? Joseph's life did not belong to himself. He had been bought, purchased, and so have you if you're in Christ. It's not your life anymore. It's not my life. My life doesn't belong to me anymore. Right? It belongs to the one who loved me and gave himself up for me on the cross. The moment of temptation is coming. Like it's a present reality for all of us. And I want you to be prepared. I want you to be ready. I want you have, to have thought it through like Joseph did before it happens. So that you're prepared, so that you're ready for the temptations that are coming. Do you believe in God or do you believe God? Right? There's a profound difference. And if we believe God, we'll prepare. I want to give you just some practical steps of ways to prepare. Number one, pray for spiritual power to resist temptation. The incredible news is that you and I don't have to fight this battle by ourselves. And one of the ways that we fight the battle for temptation is by recognizing that I'm not strong enough. You're not strong enough to overcome temptation by just trying hard. Have you ever tried to do that? And it, come on, how many of you just said, and I, I've got a habit or sin or temptation, I don't want to do it, and so you just like, I'm going to will myself not to do this, and what happens? You do well for a few hours, right? A day, maybe a week if you're really strong, but it doesn't work that way. You see, temptation is a spiritual battle, and you've got to fight the spiritual battle with spiritual weapons, and one of those weapons is prayer. And so ask God each day, say, God, help me to have the power not through my strength, but through your spirit to overcome, to resist, to refuse the temptations that will come my way today. Help me to trust you. Help me to believe what you've said is true. Give me the power. In fact, when Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, when they said, Jesus, teach us how to pray, one of the things that he taught them to pray was that they were to pray for spiritual power to resist temptation. That they were to ask God for power when it comes to temptation. So ask God each day, say, God, help me. Make it a part of your morning routine. Maybe when you're brushing your teeth, right? You should do that in the morning, right? Good, yes. All right, it's a good thing. Maybe when you're brushing your teeth, just in your mind, in your heart, just say, God, help me to have the power today to resist temptation. Number two, feed your mind with God's word. Right, God has given us his word, his truth. And God's word isn't just, just words on pieces of paper. The Bible says it's living and powerful and it gives us power to overcome temptation. So fill your mind with truth. Develop convictions, right? Develop convictions from the truth of God's word. When temptations are met with convictions, you'll have greater power to overcome them. Temptations need to be met with convictions. It's how Jesus fought temptation, right? Remember when Jesus was led out into the wilderness and Satan tempted him? What did Jesus do every time that Satan tempted him? He used God's word. He used the scriptures. And listen, Satan knows how to use the scriptures too. Because remember, Satan would kind of throw some verses at Jesus. But Jesus always came back with truth from God's word. And he gave us a pattern. Fill your mind with God's word. Feed on God's word. And number three, distance yourself from the opportunities to sin. You know, sometimes you just have to put distance between you and sin. There came a point for Joseph that he just had to run. Right? There just came to a point where he says, I have to get out of here. The, the, the temptation is too strong. It's, I've got to go. So don't put yourself in places where it's easy to give in. Listen, we can't avoid all temptation, but we can certainly, certainly position ourselves where we're in a better place to fight it than others. You know, so many times in life, you know, we want to know how close to the line can we get, don't we? And people ask me this question, is it a sin if, right? 
Have you ever asked that question? Is it, you know, and, and so what we're saying is, how close can, because somehow we bought into the line that, that the lie that, that pleasure is found at the line, right? But you know, here's the thing. If I stand right here, how many of you are nervous right now, right? You're nervous for me because you know I'm clumsy, right? And, and you know what could happen. See, if I stand here, eventually I'm going to slip and I'm going to fall. I, if I make one bad move, right, I'm gone. But if I choose to stay back here, my chances of falling have what? They've diminished, right? And even if I make a misstep or a mistake, right, I haven't, I haven't gone over the edge. Distance yourself from the opportunities to sin. First, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22 says, Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Did you catch that? He says, flee youthful lusts, run away, put distance between yourself and sin. And he says, don't run alone. He said, find some people that believe the same things that you do and run together, right? Because there's power when we're not alone. So he says, do this with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. We can distance ourselves from sin, not just physically, but mentally and spiritually, right? By the things that we consume, right? The media that we consume, the music that we consume. All the things that we take in can either bring us closer to God or further away from God. Distance yourself from sin. God always will give you a way out. Even if it's prison. It's not necessarily going to make your life easier when you resist. In fact, sometimes the very easiest thing to do is to follow the crowd or to do what's most desirous to yourself in the moment. But God calls you not to always take the easy road and by faith to trust him. It may not make your life easier. It may not make you more popular. It may not get your friend list longer. It may not make your circumstances better. But I want you to know, and we're going to see in Joseph's story, God will honor your faithfulness. And your willingness to trust God will position you to fulfill the plans and the purposes that God has for you. I want you to fight this battle victoriously. Would you pray with me this morning? Our Father in heaven, Father, I thank you for your incredible grace and kindness that you've shown to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you that my sin and our sin and the sin of the entire world was placed upon your Son. Father, I thank you that because Jesus died for us, that we can be forgiven of our sin. And Father, I pray for those this morning that, that, that may be listening to this message and know that they feel guilty about the, the sin that they've committed, the temptations that they've yielded to. And Father, I pray that they might bring their guilt to the one who is ready and willing and able to forgive and to heal and to restore. And Father, I pray for all of us that, that you would help us to see the seriousness of sin. And Father, that we might take the provisions that you've given us to overcome temptation, that we might fulfill the great purposes that you have for our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.